Welcome to today's panel to mark the launch of the report, ESG and Asset Management, The Future is Now. As investment managers grapple with determining their own best practices for factoring ESG into investment decisions, OMFIF, in partnership with Mazars, is very pleased to release this timely report. In today's discussion, we will look at a number of industry issues related to ESG and asset managers, evolving approaches to ESG integration, the role of data, metrics, and standards, the rise of regulatory frameworks and third-party providers, and last but not least, how to do good for society and the planet while doing well for clients and investors. It's easy to forget that the term ESG was only first coined in 200, 2004, in a UN study, Who Cares Wins, and only a year later in 2005 that voluntary rules to guide institutional investors on incorporating ESG criteria into investment decisions was first introduced in the UN Principles for Responsible Investing. After a somewhat slow start, 15 years on, the trend to incorporate ESG into investing has snowballed. In the U.S. alone, money managed by ESG factors now exceeds 51 trillion, or 33% of total U.S. assets under management. Green bond issuance, which reached a global high of 290 billion in 2020, is on track to reach 500 billion in 2021. And driven in part by the pandemic, which accelerated the need for global sustainable recovery, the total global green bond market is now more than 1.2 trillion. That said, many managers, investors, financial firms, and corporations are still racing to catch up, to understand the explosion of data, how to use, measure, and report data, as well as what the different regulatory frameworks and standards mean for them. Also, how to square the challenge of doing good and doing well at the same time, and what that means for their clients' financial results, the portfolio companies they invest in, as well as their own carbon footprint. Listening to asset managers and understanding their challenges globally has been the primary underpinning of this project. We are especially pleased to be joined today by a distinguished panel of experts to share their views on these issues and the report's findings. Laura Chow from IFC, Global Head of Funding, Treasury Market Operations. Jonathan Bailey, Neuberger Berman, Head of ESG Investing. Brandon Cooperman, Mazar Senior Manager for Asset Management and Caitlin Bergen, BlackRock, Director of Sustainable Investing. I'm Patricia Haas Cleveland, U.S. President of OMFIF, and delighted to welcome everyone today. Before we begin, just a few quick housekeeping rules. After the panelists make initial remarks, the floor will be open to questions, so please submit them in the chat box. Today's discussion is on the record and will be available on OMFIF's website, www.omfif.org, under the Sustainable Policy Institute within 48 hours, so please check there for the recording as well as additional wide-ranging ESG content that might be of interest. Before turning to questions for our panelists and to help set the stage for the discussion, let's start with some of the key findings. Brandon, perhaps you could highlight some of these for us. Sure, thank you, Patricia. And let, let me just take a quick minute here to, to thank today's panelists in advance for sharing their perspective with us today. Um, you know, thank all our guests for joining and, and certainly thank you, Patricia, and the entire OM15 for a great partnership and, and one that we look forward to continuing to build on. So thank you for that. Um, I'll just briefly talk on the report before we dive into some Q&A. Uh, the report was really a wide ranging exploration of the state of ESG in the asset management industry today. Uh, really, no topic was off limits. Uh, we, we spoke about the, the challenges, the opportunities, the regulatory environment, the pace and scale of adoption, uh, the convergence of, of data and technology and transparency, and, and certainly the, the explosion of client demand for more um, and what all of that means for us moving forward and for the various constituents across the industry. Um, and in conceiving the report, it was, it was deliberate and important for us not to just share with you the Mazar's perspective or the OMFIP perspective. Uh, instead, the report is primarily told through the eyes of, of some of the industry's top asset managers and thought leaders. Um, and we did take very seriously our role of, of listening and making sure that, that their voices came through. Uh, I'd say what we learned through the conversations uh, we had with, with asset managers of all shapes and sizes, uh, you know, I think we had generally suspected this, but it was further confirmed through, through our work, is that ESG is not a one size fits all proposition. It is not static. It's not backward looking. 
Um, and, and certainly it is not just a tagline that we could neatly package up in a box and, and tie a bow around. Um, instead, it's, it's very nuanced and layered and complex, and it, and it really means something at least a little bit different to everyone. Um, but while you know, the approaches and the challenges and the opportunities might differ slightly from, from one firm to another, uh, one thing was, was universal you know, through all the asset managers that we talked to, and that is really that the clients are demanding a lot more. Uh, more transparency, more trust, more disclosures, uh, more product uh, offerings. Uh, and so, you know, at this point, doing nothing is really uh, not an option for, for asset managers. I think, um, you know, I'll just close the opening here by, by saying, ultimately, we end up with a question, uh, how do you bridge the gap between being a responsible steward of your client assets and being socially responsible and a steward of ESG? And I think inevitably the conclusion you come to is that it's not binary and these two things are not mutually exclusive at all. And in fact, to the contrary, uh, it has become increasingly clear that in order to be responsible stewards of your and fiduciaries to your clients, you must be tackling these issues surrounding sustainability and ESG and making sure that you have an enduring sustainable business model. So uh, hopefully some of those themes come across uh, in the report and, and during today's discussion. Um, and perhaps we can get to some questions for, I would say, my much more esteemed co-panelists. That's great, Brandon. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think you really did hit on the million dollar question um, in your closing point there. Let's turn to ESG approaches because the report looks at how ESG approaches not only have differed, but have evolved over time. Um, initially, there was a lot of focus on a more relatively narrow angle of negative screening and exclusions. It evolved to look at more active ownership and positive screening. Now the approach is to really be much more fully developed and deployed across all business areas and lining business objectives also with ESG objectives. So to start, I'd like to just turn to Flora. Um, from the IFC, which is an MDB, obviously different than a, a traditional asset manager, um, but you are in the treasury. And let's just say at the outset, the IFC as an MDB has already had for a long time a mission to do good. That's at the heart of all its IFC projects. But you as a global head of funding and treasury operations also has an equal responsibility uh, to do well for your shareholders. So how do you square this? How has the approach to ESG evolved and impacted treasuries um, operations and decision making. Thanks, Patricia. And thanks, Brandon, for the overview of the paper. It really resonated in a lot of ways. Um, so maybe just taking a step back with IFC, uh, we've been around for 60 plus years and we are part of the World Bank Group. So when we look at our mission, we're looking to alleviate poverty and increase shared income prosperity. And so those things can only be done, we believe, in a sustainable way. And so sustainability is at the core of everything we do. If you look at um, the term ESG that you mentioned, the who cares wins, um, we actually were part of that working group who, who wrote the paper. And so through time, we've, um, we've really looked to try to be standard setters uh, in this space. So on our business side, when we lend or provide equity or financing to a private sector client in an emerging market, we have a sustainability framework that we essentially impose on the project if we were are to move forward. So we have a framework that covers uh, performance standards, which uh, many may be aware of, which uh, we have eight performance standards that cover the environment, cover, cover labor conditions, indigenous peoples, uh, really the whole spectrum of E, S, and G. And those standards, um, we define those standards and require that our clients use them uh, in order for us to provide the financing. And we also have a corporate governance framework uh, that covers, I guess, the G in ES and G uh, to ensure that our clients are also following best practices when, when dealing with corporate governance. So this is on the business side of what we do. Every project we invest in goes through a rigorous E, e and S and G uh, uh, framework and approach. On the treasury side, uh, 
Treasury, we look at both the balance, both sides of the balance sheet. We have our liabilities um, and our assets and assets. I've covered some of them, but we also have a very large liquid asset portfolio investing in highly um, highly rated fixed income products. There we have an ESG approach, um, which perhaps I can go into in, in a little later. Um, but, uh, but on the funding side, we also not only have our funding program, which looks at uh, green and social uh, programs that we have, um, but we also have created a, a an ESG survey that we have our dealers or underwriters utilize um, when we're determining uh, who we decide to put on uh, be benchmarks um, for issuance of our bond of our bonds and um, and there again I can go into more detail a little later great okay um Jonathan, Newberger Berman has approximately 55 investment strategies that it offers clients. How has your ESG approach evolved and how do you balance the sort of doing well versus doing good across these different investment platforms? Uh, well, thank you, Patricia. And it's lovely to be here with everybody today. Um, Newberger Berman manages strategies across fixed income, public equities and private markets, as you say. And each of those strategies are actively managed, which means that we're looking for sources of alpha that are appropriate for the types of securities we're buying. So that means that if you're in a value strategy, like a large cap value strategy, you're going to inevitably be owning companies that are relatively cheap for a reason. Right? Mm -hmm. Their governance may not be as strong. Their environmental and social characteristics may have associated them uh, with challenges. Uh, and so the type of ESG analysis that you're going to do and the type of risk assessment you're going to do on that is going to be appropriate for a value strategy. In contrast, if you're investing in one of our sustainable impact funds, you would never see those names in those portfolios, right? You would be seeing some of the highest quality names in those portfolios whose core products and services deliver measurable, positive environmental, social outcomes for people uh, and all the planet, um, and who use their market power in a constructive way uh, to, to, to deliver positive outcomes. So, so we have to adapt our ESG approach and integration to bring the best insights for the investment objectives of each of our different strategies. And our clients, you know, find that to be really uh, fresh and helpful, right? Um, they, they look to the ESG analysis to be embedded into the investment process, into the portfolio manager's thinking. And so over the last five years, we've increased steadily the proportion of the strategies and the proportion of client assets that formally and demonstrably integrate ESG in a steady fashion. Um, you know, back five years ago, you know, it was down at around 25% of the assets we managed. Uh, at the end of this year, it's going to be close to 85% uh, um, as we worked hand in hand with each portfolio manager to understand how ESG analysis can help them deliver on their investment objectives. Uh, for clients. And I, so far, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying this on a recorded thing, so I'm sure someone will add a comment uh, at the end that uh, disabuses me of this notion, but I've not yet met a client who's told us to stop looking at material ES and G characteristics as part of our investment processes, right? These are, in our view, financially material topics, and, and any good investment process um, should consider them. The challenge, and I know we'll talk about this in more detail later, is how you do it and the data and the mechanisms that you use to actually assess these, that's where the magic happens. Uh, but I think increasingly uh, the clients that we work with, whether it's individuals, institutions, um, they uh, think that this is an important part of good investing. And you know, we're excited that we've been able to incorporate it across such a wide swath of different investment strategies uh, on our investment platform. Well, that's great to hear uh, how much momentum is also coming from your clients. Um, Caitlin, let's turn to BlackRock. It's the largest asset manager in the world with more than nine and a half trillion assets under management. But at the same time, you've been a leader in the ESG space, demonstrating uh, a commitment to ESG as a part of your BlackRock overall priority investment mission. Um, also, I noted you stated at the beginning of 2020 that you wanted to achieve a goal of having ESG integration across all your platforms in public and private markets by the end of the year. I understand that's happened, so congratulations. Um, so can you tell us a little bit in your uh, at, at BlackRock how this commitment 
and the playing out of the commitment has evolved over the last few years. Absolutely happy to and uh, great to be here with everyone this morning. Um, so I would say a few things. The first is, uh, as you noted, Patricia, in uh, the beginning of 2020, we put a bit of um, a flag in the sand and said, you know, sustainability is at the core of how we do business and at the core of how we invest. Um, and that was in Larry Fink's annual letter to CEOs. Um, one thing I always like to um, clarify around that is that's not the first time we thought about this issue. It was a much, I think, longer evolution for us, along with the rest of the industry. Um, and I'd note a couple of things about that evolution and to how we got to where we are today, which I'll make a few comments on. The first is there's one guiding principle that has guided us uh, in everything we do since our founding and then also uh, with our sustainability journey. And I think what's been at the heart of us putting this at the center of how we do business. And that's our fiduciary obligation. Um, every investment we make on the index side, on the active side, is investing um, that we're doing on behalf of our clients with the ultimate objective of driving long-term value creation for them on a risk-adjusted basis. So that is our overwhelming guiding philosophy. So when we think about sustainability and the journey we've taken as a firm, um, there's a couple things specific um, around what that means for us. Um, so the first piece, um, which I know Jonathan was just speaking to, is this concept of ESG integration. And, and you, as you just said, we had made a commitment uh, at the start of 2020 to be 100% ESG integrated across our active book, both public and private markets by the end of that year. That is something um, we achieved. Effectively, again, that is equipping our portfolio managers to look at material financial risk and opportunity from an environmental, social, and governance lens. The reason we feel this is so table stakes and we undertook a pretty robust process uh, to do this um, was because we don't fully believe ESG risk and opportunity are captured right now or priced in by traditional financial metrics. We think they are financially material uh, drivers of performance that are not actually fully captured in tra traditional financial reporting methods. We think that's, that will change over time. And probably in the next five to 10 years, we will see much of this priced in depending on what asset class um, or what sector you're talking about. We don't think it's there yet. So undertaking this robust process around risk mitigation, um, around holistic uh, risk management, um, data and analytics, as I mentioned, is key to this and also governance structures in place to ensure these risks and opportunities are being captured is really just overall core to our broader fiduciary duty. So that's how we think about ESG integration. And then kind of uh, complementary and related to that is the evolution we've seen in client appetite for leaning into particular sustainable ESG or impact outcomes. Um, and that can manifest in a few different ways. Some clients choose to do that through products that have exclusionary screens. Some choose to do it through tilting a portfolio, as I think you mentioned in your introduction. And then some increasingly, um, we've seen a focus on really driving um, towards impact or sustainable outcomes. Uh, so investments that are really going to drive a solution to some of these great world problems we see, whether climate change, social inequity, et cetera. So we see that across the spectrum. And with that in mind, we've really been increasing the choice and the breadth of strategies we offer across asset classes and across these different themes. Um, we had made another commitment in early 2020 to get those dedicated kind of sustainable oriented strategies to 1 trillion by 2030, um, where around uh, 435 uh, billion um, in assets in those dedicated strategies as of the end of Q3 of this year, again, across asset classes and across sustainable and ESG uh, themes. Um, and so well on our way there, but that again is driven by client appetite and also by increasing conviction, I think, in the investable insights we can take in this space. A lot going on at BlackRock, but uh, it's interesting to hear how you're also very much uh, driven by client demand, which is great to hear, similar to, to Neuberger. Um, let's stay on that theme of integration uh, for, for a minute. Brandon, um, with Mazars as a global audit accounting and advisory firm, you actually look at your firms in a very holistic way across all businesses and processes. Um, in addition, you recently published, uh, again, working with us, so thank you very much, the uh, Sustainable Finance Policy Tracker, which we will come back to. And that obviously looks at a, a range of, of ESG factors and how they've played out. So what would you say from your perspective, uh, how you've seen ESG being integrated in firms, uh, businesses, processes, and, and products, and any of the key challenges you noticed? 
Sure, sure. Thanks, Patricia. You know, I, I guess in terms of the integration of ESG in business processes, uh, you know, we've seen a number of, of themes that that we might um, humbly suggest, you know, deserve some consideration and is where we've seen some of our clients have some success. Uh, you know, I'd say, you know, overarching first and foremost is the implementation of an operating model with um, responsible governance and oversight at its core. Um, you know, you know, now you really need to have an all hands on deck approach where you are setting the tone at the top and creating the culture and the environment and the conditions necessary for other ESG and sustainability in initiatives to, to more readily fall in place. Um, you know, you know, then we can get into the more specifics of, of ESG implementation and some of it's regulation dri driven, some of it's uh, could be driven by investor demand. Um, you know, for example, how are you defining your net zero strategy? So we've seen, you know, firms, you know, go after and try to, uh, you know, you know, put out, you know, in, in earnest, you know, how they're addressing that. How are you showing more transparency, uh, particularly with regard to metrics you're using to screen an investment portfolio? Um, and the list goes on. And, you know, I know we sometimes we focus a little bit too much on the climate risk part, but, but there's a lot more under the ESG umbrella. Um, I mean, you know, for example, the, the leadership teams and boards of directors of companies and, and, and funds and uh, asset management teams look a lot different than they did 10 years ago. Uh, as we head into 2022. Um, and so, you know, part of that's the result of, of regulations, for example, you know, NASDAQ with its requirement to uh, disclose board demographics and have more diverse board representation. Um, but in the private sector, even where there may not be regulations yet per se, um, the companies that are reacting to the signals from the market and taking on these challenges um, and listening to their investors, uh, we think that that makes for, for a very compelling, uh, durable and sustainable business approach. And so, um, you know, we've, we've seen, you know, our clients have success, you know, folding those into, into their operations. Thank you for that. Kaylin, I want to go back to you on integration um, because you've, you've said uh, as a company that you're black, that all your active investments have integrated these ESG considerations and that doing so helps to manage risk and deliver better returns for clients. So I don't want to put you on the spot, but what has been your practical experience with regard to both in terms of helping to manage risk as well as delivering better financial returns? And I'm glad you noted the, because uh, I was going to ask you about it, the, the, the next goal you have to sort of hit this um, by, 2030, by 2030 to hit this very ambitious goal, which you seem very uh, well on your way to. So maybe you can talk a little bit more drilling down what incorporating these um, goals has had in terms of an impact on financial results. Absolutely. Um, and so again, I will just kind of put this um, slight screen between uh, the two objectives we're talking about here, the two goals. They're related and complementary, um, but we are talking about sort of two different practices um, related as they are. So on the integration side, as I said, this is um, all around um, comprehensive and holistic risk mitigation. And again, incorporating the data and analytics that we feel give a broader view um, to our investors so that they can make the best action, take the best actionable and investable insights. Um, so from that point of view, I would say that when it comes to performance, yes, we do feel, and we feel that we've seen and our research has shown that if you are taking a fuller set of considerations into risk and opportunity, particularly considerations, as I mentioned, that we find are material in nature, but that maybe haven't been captured elsewhere in a financial analysis, that you will drive better performance overall. And as I said, we see that as table stakes now. That's just a part, uh, something we did very proactively, but it is a part of our holistic risk management um, and kind of portfolio construction process because we think it is key to understanding and driving overall performance um, and risk controls. Now, second to that, uh, as I said, related, um, but kind of a second goal or a, a slightly separate one is when we begin to talk about these uh, solutions that have a clear ESG sustainable or impact outcome. And that's what I was um, specifically speaking to when I talked about that $1 trillion goal 
and kind of the where we've gotten to so far on that journey. So when we talk about um, active performance in those types of strategies, and, and I'll take actually a step back for a second. Typically, when we see a client want to put money towards a ESG or sustainable um, strategy that has a particular outcome associated with it, they're going at that for one of two reasons. Either it's aligning with their particular values, and we want to offer them that choice um, to have that option to invest in that way, or they're doing it to lean in into a particular macro trend that they believe in. So maybe that's the opportunity in clean tech. Maybe that's research that has shown um, that companies that are better on certain diversity issues actually for, perform better over time. So it's one of those two motivations when we see clients want to make that allocation to a strategy with a sustainable outcome. Now, when we think about performance and alpha generation, obviously, any active strategy, um, the performance of that strategy will come down to the overarching investment thesis, the manager, the universe, et cetera. However, we do see some real opportunity in this area. And overall, one important guiding principle of our entire sustainable platform is that we do drive towards uh, financial returns that are non-concessionary in nature. Um, so these are uh, strategies that are designed to deliver market rate returns um, alongside their non-sustainable peers, um, but perhaps they're leaning into a particular investment thesis related to a sustainable outcome, i.e. companies that are better positioned for the transition to a low-carbon economy will perform better over time, and that's the underlying thesis. So that's how we're thinking about the performance and the um, kind of risk mitigation piece for those dedicated strategies. And as I said, uh, first, the first thing I discussed, integration, that is just holistically now incorporated into um, everything we do on the active management side. However, and I have to say this quite clearly, what integration does not mean is that it does not mean we're attaching a sustainable objective to the rest of our active platform. It merely means we're taking financially material considerations um, into account when we invest. And that's, uh, that's a good point to, to clarify, I think. Jonathan, I wanna go back to something you said earlier, which is that you, you've you noticed a shift from um, clients, existing clients asking about ESG and how it's incorporated uh, into their portfolios to coming to, to Neuberger Berman with specific ESG uh, objectives. So let's talk about the product side a little bit. Um, and some of these have included, uh, as I understand it, building a net zero multi-sector credit or a net zero investment grade credit portfolio. So can you tell us a little bit about how you've, how you've worked this dual track, both on integrating it as well as looking at some of the, um, the specific products your clients are asking about? Yeah, absolutely, Patricia. I mean, one of the things that's, I think, um, been quite incredible over the last 18 months or so has been the the number of, of asset owners who've made commitments around the transition to net zero. Um, and what we found is that, that some of those institutions have got a very clear plan for how they're going to implement that. And some institutions have made the commitment and, and are then they're going to think through how to execute it uh, over time. Um, so we've worked with a number of, of our clients to help them to think through how they're going to actually put that into practice. Because, you know, it's, it's easy enough to take a few things off the table. You know, we put in a thermal coal exclusion policy uh, a couple of years ago across all of our commingle funds, for example. So you, you can take some of the clearly not aligned sectors and activities um, out of the investment universe, but to actually get the sort of 50% absolute emissions reduction we need to see by 2030 and the, uh, and the full uh, journey to net zero by 2050 um, does require you to actually look forward towards the type of engagement that you can uh, have with corporates to push them because it's, it's basically you know, not possible today to build a portfolio that has zero emissions unless you're willing to pay for, uh, for certified emission reduction credits and, and that has a, a cost associated with it that frankly we don't believe clients should be paying for it. Um, so we work with, with a number of our clients to, to think about their strategic asset allocation, incorporating climate risk assumptions into how they forecast their capital market assumptions for the risk and return of, of different asset classes like emerging market debt or U.S. equities. Um, and then we looked at individual asset classes and we said, let's, let's build out some of these net zero aligned um, uh, portfolios. And for us, actually, fixed income is a really important part of the story because in equities, you know, of course, engagement is about shaping retained earnings and governance and, uh, and, and control of the company. 
Um, but uh, a lot of the capital that needs to be put into the system to help companies to reposition themselves to net zero or to fund climate solutions is going to come from the debt markets, right? That's, that's where a significant portion is going to come from. And so fixed income investors need to be held to account for the funding that they're providing and where that's going. So what we've done with our multi-sector credit uh, capabilities is to build out a solution that embeds the climate transition uh, targets for higher alignment uh, with net zero by the underlying uh, issuers, uh, significant step down reductions in absolute emissions through 2025 and 2030, and an increasing allocation to climate solutions so that for the clients that are invested in the strategy, they know that their fixed income uh, sleeve of their portfolio uh, is on that journey um, and, and doing so not simply by just excluding a whole bunch of things today, but really by using that influence that fixed income investors have by providing capital to try and push and encourage issuers to reallocate their capital towards the climate transition. And, and we've seen that um, to be actually very effective, particularly once you get out of the very largest high grade uh, issuers, you know, the Microsofts and so on in this world, who are already doing a lot of great work. And, 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 and so there's less really that investors need to do on the engagement side there for the climate transition. We find that there's a huge amount to be done in emerging markets and in the high yield space, which don't have as many equity investors often and are operating in more uh, capital constrained environments, you know, which have as a result higher capital costs. And so our influence in shaping the direction of those issues, uh, you know, I think can be quite transformational. And that's what we put at the heart of these, of these net zero fixed income solutions for clients. That's great. And while we're on the topic of sort of specific products that have been developed around some of these ESG issues, I'd like to turn to Floor real quickly, um, because I think you've done a lot of very interesting work, innovative work around uh, ESG and some of the products that you've developing as part of this transition to net zero, um, sustainability linked bonds, blue loans, and other new financing tools. Can you tell us a little bit about the experience you've had with these products? Sure, sure. So uh, we, we do like to think of ourselves as being innovative in some of these areas. So we do issue green and social, as I had mentioned before, but on our business side, when we're investing, we do invest in uh, gender bonds, blue bonds, and these sustainability linked bonds or loans. And of course, these are in emerging markets. We also have funds where we partner with asset managers to, to try to grow the green bond market in an emerging market country or um, emerging market region. Um, but, but I also think what's important, just listening to Jonathan and Caitlin, is, you know, Neuberger, Berman and BlackRock have done so much in the ESG space um, in terms of developing your own policies and procedures and framework. And I guess for the audience, for those that are looking to develop further, um, something that IFC and the World Bank Group does is not just the investments themselves, but a lot of advisory and technical assistance work. And so we have, you know, listening to some of these things you guys are talking about, we have, you know, frameworks, guidelines, toolkits, um, all these things that if, if you're an asset manager who is maybe at the beginning or a little bit earlier on in the journey of getting into your ESG integration, we have you know, a playbook that you can follow to see everything that needs to be hit. And these are um, developed by our experts that have worked with, you know, global companies across, you know, over 100 countries. So it really does give a holistic view of, of what um, might be helpful for some people that are looking to, to integrate. Um, one thing I wanted to mention as well is uh, Paris alignment, because I think, Jonathan, you're talking about net zero. So Paris alignment um, with, with uh, the World Bank Group's recent um, climate change action plan, uh, we've, we've mentioned Paris alignment and how we want, IFC specifically, 100% of our um, investments to be Paris aligned uh, in, by 20. 2025. And so what does that mean? That means that every single project we do, um, we have to do no harm with respect to the Paris goals. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's another thing that 
uh, we're creating guidelines for, and it's still a work in process because this was announced, you know, a couple months ago, uh, or I guess in the summer. Um, but th this is something that we hope that asset managers, investors, um, and, and our clients can utilize um, as we create these to, to help really drive to that net zero goal um, and, the, and the Paris goals. Thank you. And I'd like to come back to something I think we've all touched on a little bit, which is how do you work um, in helping to drive ESG in your corporations, your portfolio companies that you that you work with? Um, Caitlin, I'm going to come back to you again, uh, just to say that not only is, is BlackRock the largest asset manager in the world, but it also has uh, ownership stakes in many, if not most of the uh, S&P 500 companies, which makes it a pretty big player in large public companies around the world. Um, it gives you a lot of power to determine how a public company operates. So how do you work with your companies in terms of engaging them on, on ESG? Absolutely. Um, and so when we think about um, long-term engagement, um, the bulk of that on the index side of our book, which is a huge proportion um, of our assets um, is done by our stewardship team. So we have a dedicated effort um, on the stewardship side globally who undertake um, and their kind of general philosophy around this is long-term engagements, again, being guided by that fiduciary duty that I laid out first um, uh, in discussing kind of how we invest. So again, when they think about engaging with companies on traditional governance issues, uh, corporate pay, um, accounting practices, um, they're also now broadening that or have always kind of broadened it to think about what else is financially material to a company's bottom line. So when we think about ESG, risk, engagement, et cetera, um, they're going to engage again in areas where we think um, a company can evolve to drive better performance and ultimately better long-term value creation on behalf of our clients. Um, so an example of that would be one of the public asks we made of our portfolio companies earlier at the start of this year when we came out with our net zero uh, commitment uh, by 2050 was to ask for, um, I guess, fuller, and we do see many companies doing this, but ask more broadly for disclosure, um, either alongside the Task Force on Climate-Related uh, Financial Disclosure, the TCFD, which we think is a great framework and are very supportive of, and we, um, we report according to ourselves. Um, so we asked our uh, portfolio companies to either report along that or to make clear what their business plans for this broader transition to a net zero economy were. And again, that's coming again from this mindset of value creation, not imposing values, um, because ultimately, this isn't an exercise in thinking, oh, this sector is no longer going to be relevant. We are rooting um, for any company that we hold on behalf of a client to perform well over time. Uh, that's why we're invested in them. And so in engaging with them, what we're hoping to do is to work with them to evolve practices over time that are going to evolve in light of what we see going on and kind of a, from a broader macro trend perspective. So in climate, again, those are some specific examples of what we've asked for around disclosure, um, around evolving their own business practices over time. And then if we think about kind of, again, on the social side, um, seeing how companies are dealing with things like community relations, uh, diversity, both at the board and the management level, all things that um, we think ultimately will drive um, better long-term performance. So that's kind of the overarching philosophy and some of the issues um, that we have engaged on. Great. And Jonathan, just to, to come to you, you mentioned um, that uh, I know that you track and you report the percentage of clients AUM in terms of those that are integrating ESG factors. You said five years ago, this was 25% then went to 30. Next year, it may well be, uh, or by the end of this year, I guess, uh, close to 85%. So you're also seeing a huge, a huge rise in this. So it'd be good to hear a little bit about how, how you're working. You've touched on this, engaging um, with companies you invest in. And also, um, I noticed you, you've had some new initiatives in this space um, with regard to an advanced proxy vote disclosure uh, initiative, NB Votes. And maybe you can talk about that a little bit as to how that, that helps also with your engagement efforts. Yeah, thank you, Patricia. And I, you know, I think one of the things that's important to think about is, you know, ESG can play a role in many, many different investment strategies, 
But there are some places where it's a little bit less of a natural fit. So for example, we run strategies that are writing options on the S&P 500. So I can come up with a theoretical argument about how you can incorporate ESG into option writing, but let's be honest, it's not really material to the way that that strategy generates alpha. So I think there's always going to be a ceiling uh, at which point, you know, you're, you, you know, you probably don't see ESG integration being particularly relevant to some types of investment strategies. But clearly, you know, if you're buying stocks, you're buying bonds, right? Uh, you're investing in sovereigns. It, it clearly is material, and it should be part of that investment process. So I think we'll probably cap out at about 90% of all of our client assets that uh, formally and demonstrably integrate ESG. But just turning to the question about engagement and MP votes, I think this is something that we've done that we we really would love to see other asset managers copy. Um, and and I'm, I'm hopeful that, that some will, because one of the challenges with the way that the proxy voting system works is that everybody buries their, their votes in these MPX filings that are, you know, submitted to the SEC, you know, months after uh, the meetings have happened. And then uh, NGOs, you know, um, go through them and they try and sort of find who who was maybe not voting the way that they wish um, uh, that, that, that their stakeholders would like them to have done. And, um, and, and what, what doesn't happen then is a really high quality debate and discussion about how companies should be acting, either good or bad, around environmental, social, and governance topics. And so uh, two years ago, we started an initiative where we would provide ahead of the meeting publicly how we would vote on key controversial votes with a, a detailed rationale um, so that well in advance of the meeting, the company had the opportunity to understand and we would engage with them on it, but also the market as a whole was aware uh, of the rationale. Now, we're not trying to form a group. We're not trying to influence other votes. We will you know, see other people form their own conclusions. But we think that the debate would be richer if more of those perspectives were out there uh, for the media and for others to pick up on. And so just to give you a couple of examples from, from this proxy season, you know, we, we took on um, uh, about 60 key votes uh, across a range of different companies, some of which we knew we were probably not going to win. Uh, Berkshire Hathaway, for example, uh, you know, we, we put, went public uh, well in advance of the meeting, calling for disclosure uh, of basic scope one and two emissions from the underlying operating companies. Um, and Warren Buffett's been on the record in the past as saying that he doesn't think that climate is a material risk to his insurance companies. And we just think that's out of step with both the reality of everything you've heard from my fellow panelists, but also from the regulatory regime, right? The SEC is going to likely uh, call for rulemaking about mandating this type of disclosure in the coming months. So, so we, we thought it was appropriate for us to, to, to praise the investment returns that um, Mr. Buffett generated for his shareholders over a long period of time, but also to, to point out that, that this is actually an area where the world has moved on. Um, but in contrast, you know, we also wanted to, to applaud companies that were transitioning. And so there was uh, a shareholder proposal at Royal Dutch Shell, you know, an oil and gas company that not everybody is a fan of, um, but, but uh, was around their energy transition plan. Um, you know, this is a company that has done TCFE reporting, has made a scope one, two, and three net zero commitment. And if we're going to be able to work with large incumbent companies to get them to move towards net zero, we've got to support those that take the steps and actually tie CEO compensation to that journey, redeploy capital, um, because we know there will be short-term activists who, who try to get into these stocks uh, in a way that's not aligned with the long-term interests of our clients. So that kind of support publicly ahead of the votes is something that we're really proud to have, uh, have, have, have done. And you know, we'd be thrilled if, if other managers wanted to, to do that because we don't own the whole market. We, we have uh, concentrated portfolios. And so there are companies who we're not able to uh, to offer this perspective uh, to. Um, and so it'd be great if, if we saw this uh, this practice spread. Well, I think, uh, again, you bring up some really good, important points re related to that and, and why that is an important and a good idea. And so I'd like to turn, I'm also cognizant, I want to leave time for some questions to jump to the whole question of of the explosion of data as well as data gaps. And along with this, the rise of regulatory frameworks and third party um, providers and the whole question of, of, of disclosure. Um, I think what we've seen is not just an explosion in data, but it's it's also the challenge of what do you do with this data? How do you measure it? How do you, how do you incorporate it? Uh, and so 
we've also seen a number of efforts. Um, Caitlin referred to the Financial Stability Board's Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure. Um, the Sustainable Accounting Standard Board has done some work. We know the SEC has, has, has issued some things, uh, inquiries recently to, to move all this forward. So I'd love to just get a sense of where you see um, we are right now with not just the explosion of data, and the remaining data gaps, but what still needs to be done in terms of regulatory or third party frameworks to help set some kind of parameters that folks agree with. Um, and also maybe that heads towards some kind of, of consensus. Uh, one of the questions coming in is, is there a gold standard? So let me, let me start with you, Caitlin, on that, how you view this explosion and data and what sort of regulatory changes you think would be useful because as you operate in many markets as is Newberger Berman, um, obviously having some kind of clarity or consistency around standards and how you look and use data is, is important. Of course, yeah, no, happy to take that. And it's interesting, I would say questions around data usage and the question you just cited is probably one of the absolute top questions uh, we have, we get from clients as they begin this journey or if they're further along on this journey around integrating ESG into their own portfolio. Because as you say, there has been an explosion. There's been a proliferation of data over the past decade. We've gone from a very small proportion of companies um, reporting on any sort of ESG metrics back 10 years ago to now we see kind of this proliferation of all different types of reporting. And so um, I'll say a couple of things. The first is that it can be overwhelming when you look at the amount of data that's out there, the amount of third-party data providers um, that are looking at this data, that are issuing ratings on some of this data on individual companies and issuers. Um, so we say a few things about this, or the way we deal with this is first and foremost, when you think about the data landscape, what you have to understand is, uh, and what is crucial, is to thinking about data, again, from this lens uh, of financial materiality. Um, and so with that in mind, you mentioned uh, SASB, the Sustainable Accounting Standards Board. They're one body that we've, again, uh, been publicly uh, and internally very supportive of because they do something very crucial here, which is to look at underlying key performance indicators or data points and to think about them and offer a framework around how to think of them on a sector by sector basis. So what is financially material to an energy company is going to be less financially material to a tech company and vice versa. Um, we particularly when we think about certain ESG issues. And so with that in mind, the first kind of step in this process is figuring out which data points are actually driving return on a sector by sector basis, and then comparing uh, sort of peers to peers as opposed to uh, apples to oranges, uh, if you will. So I think that's clear. And that's where something like SASB is hugely additive. Um, and also being a third party framework rather than an individual regulatory regime, it's something that can be used uh, globally, which is which is certainly helpful in driving consensus because um, this is a very cross-border business, obviously. Um, so that's point one. Um, and then point two, the good news is while there is uh, still kind of, as we said, this explosion of data, different ways of thinking about it, different methodologies for interpreting that data, what will begin to drive even more consensus on this um, and more uh, ability to take real investable insights, uh, we already feel that is vastly improved over time, but we'll make it even clearer, I think, is um, from a regulatory lens, um, as Jonathan noted, you know, the SEC put out a request for information um, back in June around climate disclosure. One of the key things is that companies disclose um, on similar metrics and on comparable metrics so that you can actually, again, ensure when you're making an investment decision, you're looking at again, apples to apples instead of apples to oranges when you're thinking about how to compare two peers on an issue that you deem financially material, whether it is DEI, whether it is uh, carbon emissions intensity reduction over time, whatever it may be, you need to have metrics and data points that you can actually compare there. Um, and so that's where uh, regulation on the disclosure and issuer side um, ultimately will likely drive more consensus globally. And I think globally we're seeing that happen. And then again, to go back to TCFD, um, which we've now, I think all mentioned, the reason a framework like that is so helpful and can be a great kind of a unifier is again, because it can be looked at um, globally by investors, by companies and issuers and offers a blueprint um, 
that hopefully will be complementary to uh, any sort of individualized regulatory regime that might come into place in, in an individual jurisdiction. Uh, so that's where SASB and TCFD are really helpful here in being this unifier and being very squarely focused again on um, disclosure and on how to interpret that disclosure. That's a lot of ground you just covered there, uh, Caitlin, but it's very, very useful because those are all very important points. Jonathan, I don't know how you found the explosion in data. Does it you know, fill the gaps you need for making investment decisions or despite the growth, is there still uh, you know, a lot lacking and insufficient from a disclosure perspective? I mean, we've touched on some of the initiatives uh, underway, but would you have uh, anything to, to add to that? Look, we, we, we're we fully supportive of, of frameworks like the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board and, and CCFD. I think they're an important um, sort of minimum, right, for, for corporates to focus on. But at the end of the day, you know, we're active managers, so we're always going to ask for more. <laughs> we're always going to be looking for things in the mosaic that are going to help us uh, to value, uh, you know, an issuer. And just to give you an example, you know, that we haven't spent as much time on, um, you know, so far today, but Brandon pointed out, right, the social side is is also really important. You know, we talk a lot about climate, but equity, inclusion, and diversity is is a critical topic. And, um, you know, we see very patchy levels of disclosure of that type of data across markets, um, you know, and, and so one of the things that we've had to do is to try and fill those gaps using a number of data science approaches, right, uh, which are imperfect, but allow us to estimate some of the inclusivity of the workplace cultures um, of the companies that we invest in and that we lend to. Um, so that can be using natural language processing. It can be using web scraping to try and uh, evaluate this outside in. And you know, some of those data science techniques actually can be quite helpful in giving us early warning signs of cultures that may not be as inclusive as we'd like. And there are examples we read in the news all the time, you know, whether it's in the video game uh, industry or elsewhere of companies that, that frankly, you know, are not doing enough and there are stock price implications as well as legal and regulatory implications of those failures. So, so we're gonna be looking not just at what the disclosure backwards tells you about the company, but what we can find about the real-time insights and the forward-looking direction uh, of a company. Um, so, you know, what, what I often say to issuers is, you know, do your SASB reporting, do your TCFD reporting, get that baseline done. Um, but but we're, we're also going to be investing with you for the future. And so know that we're looking at you through those lenses as well. Um, and, and that that'll come through dialogue um, and it'll come through data science uh, to try and give us uh, that, that fuller picture uh, of the performance and culture of the organization. Thank you. Uh, we have a lot of questions coming through. I'm cognizant of the time. A lot of them are indeed on many of the things you all have been addressing around regulatory frameworks, uh, disclosure, et cetera. So I'd like to take a step back just for a second and return um, to Brandon with this um, sustainable policy, uh, finance policy tracker that you've put together. Because as I mentioned, this looked at a number of jurisdictions, I think 22 altogether of countries and different jurisdictions across 14 different categories, including regulatory and supervisory, uh, stress testing, net zero strategies, green boss uh, issuance and disclosure. So just to add a little more color that on some of these questions we're getting and what Caitlin and Jonathan have been talking about, are, are there any sort of takeaways that you get from this uh, survey that you did examining uh, a, a range of these kind of issues? Sure, no, absolutely. And, and thanks for the question. You know, again, going back to, to you know, what we've been talking about earlier. Um, you know, I think it's clear in, in looking across the, the 20 countries, yeah, certainly there's there's overlap in terms of, of what ju different jurisdictions are, are doing and, and how they're going about it, but there are also a lot of differences. Um, you know, for, just as an example, uh, climate-related risks uh, that California faces is very different from from those in the UK and what, and what folks overseas uh, might be thinking about. So, um, you know, sure, when it comes down to, to the need for a climate risk, risk reporting and disclosure frameworks, we're trying to merge them together and come to a common ground and, and find, you know, a best in class framework. Um, but, you know, you know, we've seen um, countries and jurisdictions necessarily need to diverge in certain uh, instances and circumstances where um, either they're geopolitical or they're geographical or they're socioeconomic, um, um, you know, underpinnings might might necessitate. And we're, we're rapidly running out of time. I do want to just touch on one other subject, which is sort of emerging technologies and their impact. Um, 
um, Jonathan mentioned a really important point about our discussion and the focus in general typically has been on the E in ESG, but there is also the S and the G. And Flora, again, coming back to some of the very innovative work um, you've done at the IFC, um, are there examples that you have of some of these emerging technologies and maybe which, or case studies, which maybe spawn more than just climate, but um, we have all of just like two minutes to talk about that, but I'd love okay. to hear. Oh, very quickly. Uh, we have a platform or program called Tech Emerge, where we connect uh, entrepreneurs and tech companies in emerging markets and in developed markets to try to work together and find some creative solutions. So a good example is one um, with the entity called Big Basket. They're India's largest online grocer, and they connected with a company called New Leaf. Uh, I think it's called New Leaf Dynamic Technologies, uh, based in New Delhi. And what they did was they uh, created a re refrigeration system called Green Chill, which uses biomass fuel, uh, which is biomass fueled and uses a natural refrigerant with zero. GHG emissions. And it uses um, cashew shells, like mashed up cashew shells as biofuel. And I think they tried to use coconut husks as well, but those weren't as, I guess, productive in producing energy. And what they found is that they're able to get 90% a 90% reduction in um, their fossil fuel based electricity use and their operating costs have fallen 20%. So something that may seem a little bit niche actually has a huge uh, impact given that inadequate cooling contributes to one third of all food waste and food loss globally. And this translates to $1.2 trillion of, of loss and cost to farmers, businesses, and consumers. So that's an example of a cool thing that IFC has um, worked on with a couple of our clients. Yeah, I think this, this launches a whole nother discussion we don't have time for today, but it is the impact of technologies, emerging technologies on ESG. Uh, obviously the asset managers have been, we talked a lot about some of the products, but there's under, you lift up the hood on technology and there's, there's a whole lot going on. Um, I definitely wanna go around quickly to get um, your takeaways as we're reaching the end of the hour, um, both in terms of you know, what you still think needs to be done from an industry perspective, whether that's a regulatory or third party angle, and also kind of your own goals for 2022 and beyond. I'm gonna start with you, Brandon, because I'm shortchanging you on the technology question, but if you wanna fold that in, but I, in the interest of time, we're gonna have to keep this to, to um, just under a minute each. So Brandon, please. Sure. No, absolutely. I appreciate that. Um, you know, ultimately, you know, you know, as we've spoken about, th there is an explosion of data that really is great in theory, uh, you know, and will ultimately drive more transparency across the industry. Um, but you know, to date, that there still are challenges to be met. Um, you know, ultimately, what we need is good, vetted, bona fide data, uh, and then the metrics and the models and the reporting mechanisms uh, that are consistent and comparable and transparent. You know, across the board, um, you know, and we think that that it's really important for companies to get ahead of that and to, uh, you know, certainly embed ESG-related monitoring and surveillance controls um, directly into their operating environment um, and ones that they are able to, you know, reliably track the, the data that they're looking for. Um, and we think that that'll help to put uh, them in, in a position to respond to regulators as they continue to hone in. Great, Jonathan. Key takeaways. Uh, look, done. I, I I think we're we're on we're on a journey with Net Zero to to go from you know big uh, high level statements of commitment to like real tangible action in portfolios um, and real dialogue with companies and so that's going to continue to be a huge focus for us in the uh, in the coming year. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, agree with all those points, and I would say uh, really leaning into the opportunity set around uh, decarbonization, around um, what we can kind of, where we can see alpha generation and drive results uh, from some of these issues. I think there's long correctly been a focus on risk mitigation and there continues to be, and that's great, but I think there's a huge opportunity set too. 
And Flora, and Flora, I'm gonna put a little bit extra pressure on you because you are an MDB. You have shareholders who are governments and all these governments uh, are actually shareholders in the other MDBs. So I don't know to what extent they are working together to address some of these issues, but your takeaways. Absolutely, there is a lot of collaboration and joint MDB um, work on, on Paris alignment and, and all of this. Um, so I think my two kind of forward looking concerns or things that we need to focus on is just the urgency of the the problem at hand. Um, you know, we talk about our goals of 20, 2030, and I think there are some 2050 goals out there, but it, it might be too little too late. So urgency is of the utmost importance. And then second, uh, especially in emerging markets, but across all, all markets, um, bankable projects, the creation of more bankable projects is of, of key importance. Great. Well, I want to thank you all so much for not just joining us, but really sharing some great insights uh, from your perspective. You have really unique perches where you are, um, but you're all working at the forefront of ESG and investment. So thank you very much. Thank you to all our listeners um, and stay tuned. This is a discussion that needs to continue. Thank you and goodbye.